Welcome to you. Maybe you are visiting us online for the very first time. It would be great to hear from you. Do say hello, maybe in the chat box if you're able to do that, uh, or contact us at hello at stjohnsharborn.org. We'd love to hear from you and connect with you. you know, our desire when we meet together is that we would encounter the living God uh, by his spirit uh, and as we meet together uh, to worship him and, uh, and hear from him. And you've joined us as we are underway just this last week in a series that we've called Your Kingdom Come, uh, Living as God's People in God's World. And uh, today we've got uh, John Tattersall, our Associate Vicar, who's going to lead us on in uh, our topic today, today, which is the mission of the kingdom. Really setting out some of Jesus' priorities and therefore what our mission might be as his followers. And we set that, of course, in the context of our sung worship. We're going to have some all-age input. We're going to cry out to God in our intercessions. Um, and uh, as we begin, uh, let's pray to God together. Father God, the loving and kind ruler of our lives, we ask that you would come to each one of us today afresh by your Holy Spirit, that we may worship you we may learn from you and that we may be equipped and empowered to live more faithfully for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Nothing in this world could ever satisfy. To every trial, my soul will sing. No turning back. I've been set free. Well, hello again. It's so good to be here. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about the kingdom and our mission. And I was just thinking, what comes to mind when we talk about kingdom? You might think about the kingdom in Frozen, the kingdom of Aradel with Anna and Elsa, or the kingdoms in the Game of Thrones. For those of you who are older, you might think of historical kingdoms and Alexander the Great was ruler over the kingdom of Macedonia. Coming closer to home, we all live in a kingdom, although we probably don't often think of it like that. We live in the United Kingdom and there are responsibilities that we have 
as we live in this kingdom. For those of us that are really very young, we have the responsibility of going to school and there are consequences if we don't go. For those of us who are slightly older, we're still in education, the consequences of needing to go to university. And for people who are working, then you need to work and then you have to pay tax. Those are some of the things that come with being in the United Kingdom. But today we are really thinking about the kingdom of God and what are our responsibilities in God's kingdom? What is our mission in God's kingdom? And Luke chapter 17 verse 21 says, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, Behold, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And as we think about that, there are things that we as people who belong in the kingdom of God need to do. And so to help us think a little bit about that, when we are in the kingdom, what does it take to be in the kingdom? So if you could run and get a piece of paper, I should have shown this at the beginning, I forgot, just any piece of paper. And we are going to make a crown with our pieces of paper. So if you fold it in half lengthwise first of all, and then fold it down the middle, and you can do that a further two times. And then with a pair of scissors, I'd like you to just cut into it about a centimeter or two, right in the middle. So you've got a tear there, and then we're going to cut into it diagonally to this tip here. So that's the first part of our crown, as we think about being in a kingdom. And most kingdoms have a king or a queen, so they would wear a crown. So if you open up your piece of paper, that's what you're going to have. And then we're going to cut it down the middle to help make both sides of our crown. Might need a little bit of help if you're not confident with using a pair of scissors. And so we're going to use just a bit of sellotape or you can use some glue. The sellotape is much faster to join the edges together. But before we complete the crown and make it complete. I'd like you to think of some of the things that help us belong in the kingdom. And one of those is belonging to Jesus or believing in him as our saviour. But also we can have the spirit of God within us. And so we're going to, I'd like you to write in the middle of your crown all the things that make us part of the kingdom. And then, if you close it completely with another bit of sellotape, and you should have a full crown then. And as we listen to the sermon, we're going to hear about things that are part of our mission in the kingdom of God, and like you to write them on the outside of your crown. The reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to rece release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I wonder if you've ever seen or can remember a spectacularly bad product launch. USA Today helpfully gathered 50 of the worst product launches of all time. And to save you the bother, I thought I'd mention my favorite three in that list. Firstly, we've got Harley Davidson, maker of iconic motorcycles, deciding that the natural evolution in their company would be to launch a range of fragrances. It wasn't a triumph. Secondly is the time that the makers of the impossibly delicious cheese flavoured crisps, Cheetos, decided that what could possibly be better than to offer a Cheetos flavoured lip balm? Mm, didn't do very well. But coming in for me at number one was the time that Google decided to step into the wearable tech industry with Google Glass. Uh, an eyeglasses shaped head mounted display with smartphone capabilities. And the announcement began with this statement. We think technology should work for you and to be there when you need it and get out of your way when you don't. Well, after two years of disappointing sales with criticism focusing on privacy concerns, it was clear consumers did not want or need Google Glass. Now, as we come to our reading today from the Gospel of Luke, we find Jesus at what appears to be the launch of his public ministry. Many scholars refer to this passage as the Jesus Manifesto. Joel Green, one such biblical scholar, states that this passage clearly shows that this was the kind of ministry that Jesus would exercise and that these were the themes that would recur. And what Luke wants to do, much like a company might want to do with a product launch, is to heighten our expectations about who Jesus is and what his mission is all about. Now, the start of Luke's gospel, which we've got to remember, is primarily written to a non-Jewish Greek Roman audience, perhaps with deep suspicions about who this Jesus is and whether he's just another politically charged rabble rouser from a backwater part of the Roman Empire. And with chapters one to three, Luke almost plays on that expectation with language rich with Jewish messianic fervor. Well, its high point perhaps being Mary's song, the Magnificat, as it says, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, she sings, but has lifted up the humble. And so we come to Luke 4, and what do we find at the actual public launch of Jesus's ministries? Well, actually, if we look carefully at this passage and the verses that follow after our reading, we'll see that it's a launch that both defies expectation and yet at the same time completely meets and surpasses those expectations too. Now, we've just started a talk series on Sundays called your kingdom come, living God's way in God's world. The kingdom of God is an essential theme for us as God's people, isn't it? And as Leonard reminded us last week, the kingdom of God is the central theme, really, of the entire Bible. The certainly the central theme of the life and the ministry of Jesus. The kingdom of God is what our lives would be like, what indeed the whole world would be like if God had his way and if God's will was done on earth as it is in heaven. And here, placed almost at the start of his ministry, Jesus outlines the mission statement of the kingdom of God. A kingdom, he wants to say, is now starting to break through into this world in a new way. I want to highlight three significant statements that we can make about what the mission of that kingdom is and its implications for us as followers of Jesus, living for him faithfully in whatever context we find ourselves in each day. 
but also as a community of faith here in Harborn, as we seek to be God's people here across our city and even further afield. So firstly, I want to say that God's kingdom is a kingdom of compassion. Let's read the passage from Luke's gospel together again, those critical verses from verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the plot. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus is, of course, quoting from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 61, which speaks of the longing for the Lord's anointed Messiah or Saviour to come to Israel and bring freedom and release to the people of God who are in exile and those that are left back in the Holy Land in ruin. And it doesn't take an expert in theology to hear and feel the way in which these words are dripping with empathy and compassion for people's plight. And when we look at the life Jesus lived and the way he demonstrates the mission of the kingdom, then I think one of the most accurate words we could use to describe that ministry and that kingdom is the word compassion. In the Gospels, Jesus has he sees crowds and has compassion on them. Jesus meets those in need of healing and has compassion on them. Jesus looks down upon Jerusalem later in Luke's gospel, weeping with compassion, knowing it will reject his way of peace. And by doing so, it will face future ruin and destruction. He has compassion on the thief at the cross, doesn't he? Looking past his own agony, saying, today you will be with me in paradise. And at the cross, he has compassion on a mother soon to be without a son, and a son who needs a spiritual mother. Post-resurrection, of course, he has compassion on a weeping Mary in the garden and a disciple in Peter who needs his forgiveness and his restoration. His kingdom, in other words, from start to finish, is characterised by compassion. And I think the challenge for us is obvious. Are we motivated by that same compassion? Is that how we look fundamentally at those around us? Some of you will know about and will remember this story about Mother Teresa, who served most of her life in Kolkata with some of the poorest and neediest people imaginable. People who would often make pilgrimages to come and see her, that people would come and spend time with her in the hospices and the care homes, wondering how they could help. And in response, Mother Teresa said this, you can find Calcutta anywhere in the world. You only need two eyes to see. Everywhere in the world, there are people that are not loved, people that are not wanted nor desired, people that no one else will help, people that are pushed away and forgotten. And this is the greatest poverty. You see, the gospel is good news to the poor, not just the economically poor, but always including them, but also those that are pushed to the margins of society. What a challenge. Where is our Kolkata? Not just Harborn and Birmingham, but also the places we work the streets that we live in, our homes, those places where compassion needs to be shared. Last week saw an absolute legend stepping down from an important ministry, John Kirkby, who started the ministry Christians Against Poverty, or CAP, as it's better known. Uh, It's easy to imagine now because CAP has become so important and well known, but there was a time when John Kirkby was just a man working an ordinary day job, just a person with an idea and a Jesus-centred compassion for people. And look where that took him. Our mission, both as followers of Jesus in our everyday lives and also as a church, has got to be fundamentally to have a heart of compassion. I love that our mission statement, which says, a heart for God, a heart for our city, and a heart for the nations starts with those two words, a heart. Are we moved 
with compassion in the same way that Jesus was for each other, for those on the margins of society? And is that our default way of seeing and treating others? If it's not, then there is something seriously wrong with us as followers of Jesus. Because he said, by this will all people know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. That is the hallmark of authentic, spirit-filled, Christ-like community. And we really need compassion in this next season, don't we? So many people are grieving at the moment, hurting and broken, and the church needs compassion. We need to feel people's pain, not insulate ourselves from it. Jesus treats people with great compassion, of course, and he always treats them exactly how they need to be treated. We need to weep with those who weep and show compassion for the lost. And alongside that sense of compassion closely goes, of course, a heart for justice. Sometimes things are wrong and we need to say that they're wrong. We need to both be a people and be, be, sorry, both need to be people and be a people that can raise our voices against the unjust practices of this world, that leave people isolated, ostracised, silenced by our culture and society, unwanted, unloved, pushed to the margins. We need to speak up out of our compassion. We need to stand up. We need to act up. We need to say this is not okay. We need to take a fresh look around us and ask ourselves, what is happening in our world, our communities, our lives that needs to change? And where do we need the Spirit of God to come and give us the same gut-wrenching compassion that Jesus had, that drives us to reach out to the world around us? His kingdom is a kingdom of compassion. And secondly, it is a kingdom of restoration. I love how these verses offer a reminder that people do not stay where they are once they encounter Jesus. The poor receive good news. Prisoners are freed. The blind receive their sight and the oppressed are also set free. And the next uh, few chapters of Luke hammers this point home. In the people that Jesus encounters, they receive those things because it is a kingdom of restoration, a kingdom that, that meets people where they are, but isn't satisfied with people remaining where they are. This, now, this isn't a superficial restoration either, and this really cuts to the thrust of what the gospel message is really all about. Now, like most people during lockdown, we've struggled to limit the amount of TV watching in our household. Netflix, well, that's been picked clean and dispensed with for a while. Disney Plus is still yielding some gold, especially now that they've decided to upload over a hundred episodes of The Muppet Show. But the one show we've really enjoyed as a family is called Escape to the Chateau DIY. Now, don't judge me. You already are, I know, but don't. Uh, But this is a really compelling show, honestly. It features people often British people who have decided to buy an old chateau in France and transform it, restore it and bring it back to life. And what is amazing about that show is watching people as it follows them from the the initial point of purchase of the property and then all the work that's needed to done to bring it back to life. And in many cases, be opened as a hotel or a fancy event for hire kind of place. But often jobs that seem straightforward to do on the surface take a lot longer and a lot more complicated as the work is done. Fixing one problem seems to uncover even more costly and expensive problems. And rarely is the job of restoration they thought they were taking on at the start the reality they meet as they get stuck in. And I think that's often true of the people and the communities that God is calling us to be a part of restoring in his kingdom. Sometimes the complexities of people's lives, the multiple challenges that they've had to deal with. Sometimes going back years, even decades, means that the work of the church is rarely uh, able to offer a quick fix to people. 
But whilst we often see some sicknesses and situations and problems that people face miraculously transformed, and indeed we should want to see those things and pursue them, so often the reality is that deeper things need to be attended to and dealt with over time. And it does take time and godly patience. There is a deeper restoration and transformation project that Jesus, out of his compassion, wants to deal with in each of us. And it's why Jesus seems more interested in forgiving sins and encouraging saving faith in people as much as he is in healing them. In fact, that is the deeper healing that he wants to bring to people's lives. God's kingdom is a place where all that was lost in the garden is forever restored through Jesus and through his death on the cross. We get what he had, all the inheritance and the relational connectivity that comes with being children of God, because he took what we could not bear. What does this kingdom of restoration look like in practice? Well, a while ago, I was in one of the many supermarkets in Harborne, and as I was making my way around the shop, I saw a site that most of us would recognise and I imagine would bring back nightmares from our childhood. A mother kneeling down, desperately trying to use a tissue to remove dirt from her child's face. And as children normally do in such circumstances, this one was squirming and twisting and resisting and yet at the same time was laughing and giggling as the mother made a game of it. Eventually she had finished and touched the tissue tenderly but playfully to the child's nose, looked at his face with mock surprise and said, oh, there you are. What an incredible picture of what God's kingdom reign does for people, what Jesus did for people and continues to do for people and what the mission of the church should be doing for people, what each follower of Jesus has the capacity to do for others. The part of Isaiah that Jesus quotes from has this promise later on for the beaten down and downtrodden exiles longing for hope in this world, that they will be a people who rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. What an image of the complete restoration and transformation project that comes when God's kingdom breaks into this world. Friends, the mission of the kingdom means that we are called to be rebuilders in the business of renovation and restoration, finding the brokenhearted, the lost, and those stuck in the muck and the mire of this world, to patiently and compassionately bring them to the one who cleans us, delights in us, restores us as our intended identity as his children, and says, there you. And lastly, this morning, God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. These verses remind us of that fact that God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. If we want to see that highlighted, then just look at where Jesus stops in his reading from Isaiah. He reads the verse to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He closes the scroll or winds it back up again. He sits down and he's ready to begin his teaching. And he starts by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, for most first century Jewish people, they would know this text so well. They would have been puzzled why Jesus would stop there. They would think he's missing out the crucial part of Isaiah 61. Or he's getting an important piece of information wrong. Perhaps, for example, like turning up at a Star Trek convention and getting Captain James T. Kirk's middle name wrong. It's Tiberius, by the way. Or maybe uh, talking to a serious Star Wars fan and thinking that Han Solo completed the castle run in 14 parsecs when we all know that it only took him 12. It's a bit like that. In the Isaiah passage that Jesus is quoting from chapter 61, the very next line reads this. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, yes, and the day of the vengeance 
of our God. Now, in the Old Testament and deep in Jewish thinking at the time was the concept of a year of Jubilee, a day of celebration and rejoicing every 50 years when those who were slaves were to be freed. Those who purchased land returned it to the original original owner so that it could have rest. Debts were forgiven and prisoners were freed. It was the year of the Lord's favour. However, there isn't a tremendous amount of evidence in the Old Testament that it was actually practised very much by God's people. But the idea is there that this is how God wanted his people to be, pointing towards a greater future reality. And the way this was applied, though, was that the year of the Lord's favour was for the people of Israel. And by contrast, the line about the day of vengeance was about Israel's enemies. And what Jesus seems to be saying by stopping the reading there is that the vengeance part is not what his messianic ministry is really all about at this point. Now, later on in this passage, we'll see that that Jesus's continued emphasis on grace for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, drove the crowd to fury because Israel's God was rescuing the wrong people. And in verse 22, we read, all were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Sometimes people have understood this to mean they were astonished at what a good speaker he was, perhaps thinking, how can anybody from Nazareth speak like this? But it seems more likely that what Luke means is that they were astonished that he was speaking about God's grace. Grace for everybody including the nations, instead of grace for Israel and fierce judgment for everyone else. The message was and remains deeply shocking. Jesus' claim to be reaching out with healing to all people, though itself a vital Jewish idea, was not what most first century Jewish people wanted or expected. The The biblical scholar, bishop and the author Tom Wright puts it like this. Jesus' gospel challenges all interests and agendas with the news of God's surprising grace. We need to be careful as a church and as followers of Jesus that we don't make that same mistake. That those we deem as beyond the pale of salvation are actually the very people God cares so much about and has called us to be a light to. That even in the middle of a horrible and difficult season, we can still proclaim with absolute confidence that we are living in the era of the Lord's favour. His salvation and his mercy is available to each of us every single morning. And even the seeming paradox is that 2021 is a year of jubilee when Jesus comes into the equation. His grace and his forgiveness has the ability to free people today. Maybe you need it. I was reading an article this week lamenting the fact that our culture is obsessed with atonement, putting things right, but has forgotten that the real power to release spiritual prisoners only comes with forgiveness. God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. This is our message and our mission, to demonstrate and proclaim to the world the gospel of grace and we need to model it to the world like never before. It's a kingdom for everyone. It's a kingdom for the least and the last as well as the great and the powerful. It is a kingdom of grace. Jesus reveals that God's kingdom is a kingdom of compassion, a kingdom of restoration, a kingdom of grace. That's what Jesus's ministry, his life and his death is all about and it's a ministry that he commands his followers to continue and establish it's the mission of the kingdom it's the way of the kingdom and as we close let us remember this this morning god just doesn't have a plan for my life or your life or just saint john's harbour God has a plan for the entire world and the goal of following Jesus is not us escaping this world by going to heaven 
The goal of following Jesus is to partner with Jesus in restoring this world, restoring this city, restoring families and bringing beauty back into this world. It's about giving people a taste of what it's like when our compassionate, restoring and grace filled God is in charge. So let's make that our mission today and every day until he returns or until he calls us home. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which are the chosen Good morning. We are now going to pray for compassion, thanking God for the compassion that he shows us and asking him to help us show compassion in our daily lives. We can also pray for the government and leaders in this country and around the world that they would show compassion. Dear God, I thank you now for the compassion and mercy you show us every day of our lives, even when we do not deserve it. Help us to show more of your compassion in our words, thoughts and deeds, 
Bless us now with your compassionate heart, that we may seek to display your compassion to those around us. We particularly pray for the leaders of this country, that you put in them a compassionate heart, which seeks to help all those in need. In your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. So now we're going to pray on the theme of restoration, pray for whatever you feel called to do so, but here are some ideas. The economy, the NHS, the environment, education, health, jobs, general energy for people you love. Dear Lord, we thank you for everything you've put into our lives, but we pray for a restoration of energy and comfort in everything we do. We pray for restoration in health. We pray for the world's collective health, both physically and mentally, and specifically thinking of individuals we know who need to be restored to full health. We pray for the economy and that its growth and to keep functioning effectively as a country. We pray for the reimposition of jobs where they are needed, normal working patterns for those who do not have the opportunities they need or want currently, be that through furlough or unemployment. We pray for restoration of the environment, the beautiful natural world that God has provided us with. And we just pray for just a sense of a desire from us humans to really restore that to the beauty that God wanted it to be. We pray for institutions such as the NHS and the education system and just a restoration for all those people working so hard in those institutions for us. And we just pray for resources and energy, but also a sense of normality where it is desired and where it is needed and where it is possible. Amen. Let's pray for grace. Maybe... That's going to be praying for to forgive someone else for something they've done. Or that might be praying for forgiveness for ourselves and that we may receive the Lord's grace. However that may be, let's pray for grace. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift and for the blessing of your grace, Lord. The grace that you give, the grace that you willingly gave in sending your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, to die on the cross. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for that gift of grace. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that in the week ahead, Lord, in the months ahead, Lord, would you give us and remind us, Lord, of that gift of your grace, Lord Jesus? Would you help us to forgive those who have hurt us, who have upset us, Lord? And would you forgive us, Lord, forgive us for our sins and for the things that we have done wrong, Lord? Forgive us for those people that we have hurt and for those mistakes that we have made, Lord. For it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, In him 
we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance to the riches of God's grace. And we pray, Lord, we pray that we can receive and be reminded, Lord, of that grace. Amen. And now let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, today in our service. And uh, our hope is that you have indeed uh, encountered God as uh, we've been together. And uh, we've just got one piece of uh, important uh, church family news. Uh, if you're a regular member, you can, of course, uh, look up uh, uh, more details on the, our roundup when that comes through and, and on our website. Uh, but uh, next Wednesday, that's the 24th of February at 7pm, we're going to have the second of our um, renewed uh, midweek encouragements as we look to the plans for when we reoccupy uh, our building. Almost uh, ready now for us to do so. Obviously, we will have to wait and see what the restrictions uh, with regard to COVID-19 uh, continue to uh, mean for us actually gathering together. But next Wednesday, John Tatterson and I are going to be in conversation together to look at some of the, the priorities and the vision that we sense uh, we have from the Lord for our future uh, ministries, really our mission, our particular mission, uh, uh, which of course links in with what John has been saying today. So please do try and join us if you possibly can, 7 p.m. next Wednesday, the 24th of February, uh, when we'll be uh, taking that forward. So as we close our time uh, together, let's end with a final prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your kingdom, your kind and loving rule in our lives is centered on compassion is concerned with restoration and renewal and comes to us filled with your loving, forgiving grace. Please equip us in the days ahead to be a people who more and more reflect that compassion, renewal and grace to those around us and in doing so help build for the kingdom that you alone can build. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the King of Kings. Amen. down